We notice when someone says something that's wrong for the context, like giving a long speech about how much we love our cat when we're supposed to be offering a wedding toast. That's just not the right moment for all those compliments about Mr. Whiskers. Every gathering of people or organization is going to either clearly or subtly shape what's expected. As far as conversation topics, attitudes, and behaviors go, there will also be levels of formality, like whether we'll use a first name or a Mrs. or Mr. or Dr. So many factors impact what is considered appropriate for a context. One way to think about these mental notes is as a form of impression management. It's how we attempt to shape what people think of us through how we communicate in different situations. Impression management looks very different for different people. So let's consider why we do it in the first place. I'm Cassandra Ryder, and this is Study Hall, Intro to Human Communication. So if impression management is how we shape what people think of us, then the time when our impression management sensors are on the highest alert is when we're first getting acquainted with someone. Our first impression matters a lot, but so do the second and third. It takes a while for people to form a full impression of us. So until a relationship has become routine, a lot of our communication is building their overall impression. As we think through deliberately creating an impression, we have two big questions. First, we ask how others come to know us. What are all the things they take note of? Both our words and the way we dress, our body language, and many other cues that might make them form an impression. Second, we ask who we want others to think we are. An impression is a cluster of traits that might become just a few adjectives. We might want to appear cool and aloof in some settings, eager and informed in others, and silly and outgoing in another setting. Getting to that final impression comes after multiple experiences with someone. We're going for something called congruency or consistency between the impression someone has of us and who we believe ourselves to be. The goal is to get people to hold ideas about us that are similar to the ideas we hold about ourselves. At least that's what we're usually aiming for. Imagine that Tim is an easygoing person almost all the time, but one new acquaintance named Sheila always happens to be around when Tim's sleepy, grouchy, and just can't even handle being around people. When Sheila hears someone talking about how fun and chill Tim is, she's going to privately wonder why her impression is that Tim's a prickly pear cactus. In this case, Tim hasn't noticed that he's let Sheila see him this way. However, if he notices her body language is closed and she never seeks him out in a conversation, Tim might try to change Sheila's impression of him by deliberately reaching out to her in social settings when he's feeling good enough to be his sociable self. This helps him increase the chance that Sheila will see him the way he sees himself helping Sheila make meaning of their encounters in a way that Tim wants. Impression management does happen like this with casual acquaintances. However, people put more stock in impressions when there are power differences and something big is at stake. In particular, people manage their impressions on teachers and employers, both of whom are going to be formally evaluating, not just casually noticing us. Whether we're people who love homework or dread it, we're probably not going to casually mention how much we hate homework in front of a teacher. Same deal if we dislike parts of our jobs we save the complaints from when our supervisor isn't around, since it can create an impression that we aren't committed to our work. If it's bad enough, we might bring it up in a formal conversation with our boss, but complaining about work all the time in a casual way can create an impression that lowers our reputation at work. Even on the same topic, we may try to give totally different impressions to different people. With peers in a middle school, we're much more likely to act casual and not particularly excited about school even if secretly we're loving everything we're learning. It's great if we can find groups of people where we can express authentic excitement about everything. But in most cases, we'll vary our enthusiasm if others around us seem less excited. We're social animals and pretty influenced by the attitudes around us. So how do we go from just making impressions willy-nilly to actually making a dent on the impression we're making? It's self-monitoring that allows us to change the impressions we make. Self-monitoring is our ability to notice our behaviors and modify them in response to situational pressures, opportunities, and norms, according to the American Psychological Association. We all self-monitor to different degrees. Some people are going to notice when they are making a different impression than they wanted to and immediately make a change. These folks are called high self-monitors. Others are just going to miss it, not noticing that they are leaving an impression different from what they think about themselves. These folks are known as low self-monitors. Depending on the context, our amount of self-monitoring has different consequences. Let's see how this might play out. In the television show Gilmore Girls, young mom Lorelai is excited when her teen, Rory, gets into a fancy private school. On the first day, however, Lorelai expects Rory to catch the bus and doesn't have any more professional clothes available fast enough to get Rory to school on time. When they both oversleep and Rory misses the bus, Lorelai has to drive her in a comically silly t-shirt and shorts 
an ultra-casual outfit for the highly formal school. They both care a lot about their first impression, so they drive off as fast as possible. Though Lorelai hopes to stay in the car and avoid being seen in her current outfit, she ends up having to go inside and meet the headmaster in his fancy office. While Lorelai is actually a high self-monitor in this context, and she is very aware that she's making a different impression than she wants, she cares too much about another aspect of her impression. She wants to appear involved and engaged with her daughter's schooling, and that ends up winning out over the embarrassment of her outfit. Lorelai struggles to maintain a good impression at the school over the course of the show, but the same qualities that make people see her as silly are valued in other contexts. Throughout the series, she does things that a fancy school headmaster might dislike, but which make her beloved in her small town. There are other moments where she's behaving as a low self-monitor, not noticing that she's not quite making the impressions she wants. However, the people that end up sticking by her actually value that she remains consistently herself, even if it means making a slightly odd impression. There are times when being a low self-monitor can have negative consequences. If we miss an exam and ignore the teacher's clear policy on how to make up exams, we're going to appear like we're unprepared and unobservant to the teacher like someone who doesn't proactively seek out solutions. Not self-monitoring intensively at work or school can have material consequences, like not getting to raise our grade through a makeup exam or missing out on a high-profile project at work. However, high self-monitors do sometimes have the feeling that people don't fully know them. If we're constantly trying to change the impression we make on others, the variation in perception about us can feel like we have a bunch of different circles that cannot overlap. So while some self-monitoring helps us stay professional at work and school and appropriate with new people we don't know well, we may want to ease up on self-monitoring in social situations, opting to let people form the impression they will of us, rather than worrying about whether we'll be judged as perfectly conforming to the group. This leads to the question of how we can better become self-monitors at work and school. Usually, a good rule of thumb is to observe as much as we can before we make a big impression. People who are new to the workplace understandably don't know all the standard ways of communicating. But if we approach our first day or two with the goal of noticing how other people are behaving and how others react to them, we're much more likely to feel comfortable communicating. It's also helpful to find people who we can ask directly about whether an impression is favorable, unfavorable, or even endearingly quirky. For instance, an academic advisor at college is often a great resource since they spend lots of time in academic settings but aren't the actual person grading us. At work, a trusted coworker who isn't in a position of authority over us might also be able to steer us in the right direction. If we find ourselves still surprised by the impression people have of us, we may just be naturally low self-monitors. While getting more attuned to our impression management may help in some cases, being authentically ourselves, like Lorelai Gilmore, may also help us focus on finding the people and organizations who don't need us to change ourselves to be accepted and understood. Maybe we have a weird first day of work, or maybe our friends say, really? Why so much about Mr. Whiskers in a wedding toast? But we're always capable of learning from the reactions we get from others. It's then up to us to make the best use of that information as we continue to enter new communication contexts. Thanks for watching Study Hall, Intro to Human Communication, which is part of the Study Hall Project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time!